Good evening. Uh, we're going to continue our broadcast right away. Uh, I had mentioned this little booklet on the nature and meaning of sin, and I'm going to say that anybody who's interested in having a copy, I'll be happy to send it to you free if you'll simply send me your name and a mailing address to which I can send it. But I want to go into a discussion now today a little bit of the Garden of Eden and of the fall of mankind. Uh, there are certain aspects of the story in the Garden of Eden which strike us very profoundly. One of the things that we often wonder about is the medieval arguing and disputes in the West over the nature of the trees in the Garden of Eden. They have a great deal to do with this idea of sin. And I believe Dr. Spann is going to try to flog onto us a, uh, this, this doctrine of genetic sin that they call, uh, the genetic guilt that they call original sin. And uh, I'm going to uh, take a look at the trees in the Garden of Eden for a moment. The two trees in the Garden of Eden, one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other the tree of life. In medieval Western Europe, one of the great arguments was whether the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was an apple, an apricot, or a pomegranate. I've always rather come down on the side of the pomegranate because trying to get the seeds out of a pomegranate could lead anyone into sin. And I often thought I would make my fortune if I could breed a seedless pomegranate. Uh, but anyway, I failed at that, so I became a priest. Uh, the, uh, the thing is, that let's take a look at these two trees now. Does one really surmise that you could fall into total depravity by eating an apple, even if it was in disobedience to God? Or that had you not eaten the apple, you could have gone and grabbed an apricot off of a tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden, munched on it, and had life everlasting. So there has to be some other meaning to those two trees. The trees in the Garden of Eden are a prophecy and a type of the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For when our Lord was crucified and there were two thieves, on one on either side, it was surely by God's will that this was arranged this way. For the thief who turned to Christ and confessed him, when he looked upon Christ, he saw Christ and suddenly realized that he was the good. Not just good, but the good. And suddenly realized his own wickedness, his own evil. And at that moment, the cross of Jesus Christ became the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for him. And when he turned to our Lord and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the cross of Christ became the tree of life for him. And this is the whole mystery that unfolds before us. Paradise is there where man dwells in communion with God. Not necessarily perfect communion, but communion with God. When our Lord Jesus Christ abides in our hearts, we have paradise in our heart. And the trees of the knowledge of good and evil and of life are placed before us. We can recognize our Lord Jesus Christ as the good and realize our own sinfulness. And when we see him upon the cross where he testifies of his co-suffering love for mankind, we can recognize that. This is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for us. But only when we turn to him and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, when we fully commit ourselves to Jesus Christ and realize that he is the fruit of the tree of life and that by partaking of him, we have life everlasting. By truly committing ourselves to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the cross of Jesus Christ becomes the tree of life for us. And this really is the meaning of the two trees in the Garden of Eden. Now, what is it that man fell from and fell into? He fell from a love relationship with God, a direct love relationship, in which God loved him completely, unselfishly. Mankind was created in the image and likeness of God, and that unselfish love had to be a part of that image. So man fell not into total depravity, but he did fall into egotism, self-centeredness, and self-love. And this is what the fall of mankind is really all about. The fall from unselfish love and the experience 
of an unselfish love into a self-centeredness, a self-love, an egotism that made him seek his own and therefore become unable to love his neighbor as himself and unable to love our Lord God and Savior with all his heart and with all his might and with all his strength. And this is the reason why mankind has destroyed the earth, why we have wars, why we have murders, why we have all of these other things, because mankind fell into this egotism and self-centeredness. The story of Cain and Abel makes this abundantly clear. We discussed it in another one of our broadcasts about the ecology, the story of Cain and Abel, and I'll invite you to look on the YouTube at that story of Cain and Abel and see precisely what I'm talking about because in that whole broadcast series we discussed the nature of the fall and the nature of sin. And I want you to put out of your mind this pagan idea that the fall of mankind was so extreme that the only way man could be saved was if God caused his only begotten son to be tortured and executed in order to satisfy his, God's, own ego and self-centeredness. This is certainly a temptation from the devil to believe such a doctrine that God is egotistic, self-centered and self-loving and so needed the sacrifice, had to punish man for every sin, had to torture his son to death in order to satisfy his passions. <laughs>